Okay, so I'm Debbie Martin. I'm a, um, a member of staff in the Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies. I, myself, am a Latin Americanist. I focus on um, Latin American culture, um, mainly on film. So most of the courses that I contribute in the department are film studies courses. Um, we're a very diverse department, though. Uh, we cover a huge range of material in terms of what we what we study and what we teach um, so that's uh, material from Spain and Latin America uh, many different countries in Latin America um, from we uh, obviously also do Portuguese um, Portugal and Brazil um, in terms of what we look at the kinds of artifacts that we're looking at um, as I said, I look at film. There are other film scholars in the department as well. There are people who work on literature. There are people who work on history. Um, within literature, we have specialists on poetry, drama, um, novels, short stories. Um, so we, we cover a really wide range of stuff. Um, so whatever you're interested in, you're likely to find somebody doing something um, on it at UCL. In terms of... Um, chronology as well. Uh, we are we are we, we look at work from the Middle Ages up until um, the contemporary uh, period. So a, a very wide range, chronologically, geographically, and in terms of the kinds of stuff we're looking at. Um, I'm going to talk to you today, though, because this is actually a little taster. So what we're required to do in this session is give you a little taster of what it might be like if you're actually studying one of our courses here at UCL. So I'm going to talk to you about a course which is one of our first year courses, so something that you could actually choose next year if you wanted, if you decided um, you wanted to come here and if you're admitted here. Um, and this is the course um, that I designed a few years ago, Cultural Responses to the Mexican Revolution. Um, it looks at literature, film and art. So... Um, it looks at a very important event in Latin American history, the, the Mexican Revolution, and it looks at it, initially it gives a historical overview, and then it goes on to look at cultural works which have depicted that event um, and that period. Um, so I'll, I'm going to be giving a sort of a miniature version of that course in half an hour, which is impossible, um, but picking out little bits of it. So that course starts with a, uh, a historical overview. Um, so I'll do that as well now, just so that you get an idea of, um, of the period that we're talking about. And then I'll look at some of the art and literature that represents that period with you, just very briefly going through a couple of exercises which are... Um, illustrative of the kinds of stuff that we would do on, on the course. Well, they are taken from the course, in fact. So the Mexican Revolution was a long period of civil war in Mexico, obviously, at the beginning of the 20th century. And it was a period um, where fighting stopped and started and, and, and armies uh, regrouped and turned against each other. Um, and it was extremely violent and bloody, and over one million people died in the conflict. It actually extended beyond 1917, um, but that was uh, when it, 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 so, some uh, violence extended beyond 1917. The, the, the repercussions continued for many years. It was a, a, um, a war, a civil war, in which different groups were fighting for different reasons. So the middle classes were fighting against a dictator who was in power before 1910, Porfirio Diaz. And the middle classes were generally white descendants uh, of, of, of the Spanish uh, con conquistadors. So the middle classes were fighting for political power, okay? That they wanted to have their share of the political power, um, which was currently being taken, completely taken by the dictatorship. So that was one group, the white middle classes, jet, largely white middle classes. The other group who were very important were the campesinos. Campesinos are peasants, okay? So these were the rural poor, largely indigenous or mestizo, so a mixture of indigenous and, and white. And they were fighting for completely different reasons. They were fighting against poverty, against the terrible conditions in which they live, and, and for some um, 
element of, of ownership over the land that they worked, okay, so um, trying to wrest some control and ownership from the big landowners, the, the rich landowners who owned the land on which they worked. So different groups fighting for different reasons then. Um, the conjoined <coughs> groups did end up overthrowing the dictatorship and installing a revolutionary government, but really it was the middle classes who ended up taking power in the end. Those middle classes couldn't have overthrown the dictatorship without the help of the armies of the poor, of the campesinos. Um, but in 1917, a middle-class-led revolutionary party was installed. And if you know anything about Mexican politics or you've read anything about this, you'll know that that party was called the PRI, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, and that it was in power for 71 years. So it was in power until the early 2000s. So to say this very briefly as we don't have very much time today, the campesinos and the indigenous did not benefit from the revolution as much as the white elites did. So in order to keep its hold on power, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, which was you know, dominated by those white elites, had to justify and explain that revolution. Okay, So it was an extremely violent period, as I said, very bloody, many, many people lost their lives. So they needed to explain and justify why that had happened and why they'd lost their lives. What was it all for? So there's this idea then that I um, took out of my slides because I thought it might take too long, but the idea that for a revolution to be successful and for a, st a state, a, a revolutionary state, to be successfully established, so this is the sort of the founding moment of modern Mexico, for that state to be successful, to be legitimate, to be accepted by everybody who lives there, it needs to justify how it came about. It needs to justify <laughs> the violence. And it needs to be justified and explained in a way which makes people accept the revolution, identify with the revolution. And it needs to convince the majority of people in the country that they benefited from the revolution. Okay? So that's in a very, we would go into much more detail in the course, but that's a, a very brief introduction to this period and to what comes next in the course, which is how cultural production, art, um, literature, etc., film, contributed to that justifying and explaining of the revolution. So in the period following um, the revolution, cultural production, such as in particular muralist art, as well as films and literature, contributed to, the just, to these justifications and to the conversion of the revolution into a founding myth for Mexico and helping people to identify with it. And so art, muralist art and film, um, helped to consolidate the Revolutionary Party's hold on power. Okay? And other cultural products and cultural artifacts also came to critique it as well. Um, but we're going to look, first of all, at one of the, um, the first category. Oh, sorry, that's my slide of um, Revolucionarios, so a famous revolutionary leader of um, uh, uh, the South, Ernesto Zapata on the left, and um, groups of, of uh, camp peasant armies um, and uh, um, a group of peasant women um, fighters. Um, so muralism, as I was saying, Mexican muralism, does any, has anybody heard, has anybody been to Mexico, seen murals, or heard about Mexican muralism? Yeah? Um, uh, can you tell me? Um, I did my EPQ um, on Mexican muralism. Okay, so you, you've, you've heard and read and seen quite a lot of, of murals. So, Mex uh, so muralism in Mexico was a key response to the Mexican Revolution. So in the years just after the revolution, in the 1920s, the work of Diego Rivera, you may have heard um, the husband of Frida Kahlo, you may have heard of this famous um, couple of artists. <coughs> His work contributed a great deal to the mythification of the revolution and to its justification. So therefore, kind of consolidating the power of the Revolutionary Party. 
he was actually contracted or commissioned by uh, um, the Minister of Education at the time, José Vasconcelos, um, who was part of the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, to, uh, to, to paint uh, enormous murals decorating the, some of the public buildings in Mexico City. So many of the public buildings are decorated with the murals of Rivera and the other muralists. So this uh, mural, La Sangre de los Mártires Fertiliza la Tierra, what does the title mean? The blood of the martyrs um, is making um, the ground or the earth fertile? Yes, fertilizes the, the earth, yes. Earth, uh, probably more redolent word um, for uh, expressing this idea. So this mural um, is celebrating Mexico's dead, people who died in the revolution, um, and it's celebrating a particular group, isn't it? Celebrating the indigenous and the campesinos. And in fact, um, the body on the left is a representation of Ernesto Zapata, who we saw in the previous slide, who's one of the key um, leaders. The protagonists of this mural are not the ones, the people who actually went on to have most power post-revolution, but that they are the poor and the peasants. The, the imagery that the, that the mural employs is taken from indigenous symbols. So, indi so the, um, the indigenous, the Aztec and the Maya in uh, Mexico celebrated um, fertility through the symbol of corn and through the symbol of the sun. So we have corn, maiz, yes, growing um, above the dead bodies and, um, and the sun. <coughs> so the message of this mural is pretty clear. The revolution was not in vain. The sacrifice of the indigenous and the poor will contribute to the future of Mexico, to a flourishing, to a growing um, of the nation. So if this is a mural which is very uh, positive about the revolution, and it, and, and it identifies it with the indigenous people who lost their lives, but also with the mythology of the indigenous. Okay, So it's saying the revolution was uh, a... Um, uh, it, was, it was bound up with the indigenous. It wasn't all about the white elites getting power. So it's justifying the revolution, as I said, um, as, I, as I explained before. So that's Rivera. Now I'm going to move on to um, two murals, one again by Rivera and one by another muralist, Orozco, also painted both in the 1920s, both with the same title. What does this word mean? La trinchera. Anyone know? Hmm? Yes? Trench? Trenches, yes. So it's a mural which is depicting warfare during the revolution, yeah? The actual fighting. And uh, what happened during the actual fighting. So I'm going to ask you now to comment um, on these. How would you, if you had to describe or analyse these two pictures with the same title, how would, you just, how would you describe them and how would you compare them? Any ideas? First of all, the one on the left, Rivera. How does Rivera depict the fighting during the revolution? What would you say about this image? Anything? I know m most of you, probably none of you have, may have studied art before, but you can still say, you can still comment on the shapes, the colours. Any ideas? They're working as a team, yeah. How do we know that they're working as a team? Hmm? Yes, they're all... Um, but they're active, aren't they? And they're all kind of facing in the same direction, apart from um, one who is obviously wounded and turning away. But, you know, they're all kind of, they look like a body yeah. that are all facing in the they same direction. They look healthy as well, don't they? And they look healthy and fit, despite the fact that there is some wounded. And they're holding each other up. They're supporting each other. So they look like, as, as this lady said, they look like they're working as a team. Any other comments? They're defending what is theirs from the window, from the arch. They stand somewhere where mm -hmm. it belongs to them and 
shorting whoever is attacking them. Yes, and as I said before, many of these murals are painted in public on public buildings. And so this archway um, that you see here is, is not painted on. It's actually, this is part of an existing archway but the way that the archway is employed it really it really embraces those forms doesn't it it really holds them so they look like they're sort of protected um, so they're sort of protected by each other and by the support of each other but they're also held within this nice um, uh, uh, archway um, which encloses them anything else any anything else to say about yes and um, the colors are quite bright Yes, yeah. So there's a sort of that there's a there's a suggestion of hope, isn't there, with the light, very sort of the light that's coming from the pale blue sky. They're looking towards the light, aren't they? So they're looking towards symbolically a better future. Okay, so there's lots more we could say about that, but let's um, move on to um, Orozco's version of La, La Trinchera. What is Orozco saying here? What what would you say about this mural? Yeah, much more violent image. Can you say how that violence is um, portrayed? The red colour. The red, yeah. Very sharp forms, aren't they? This one's full of nice, comfortable, cosy, rounded forms. On the right-hand side, we have these very jagged, sharp forms. So that the violence is communicated much more strongly. And the, uh, the blood red is obviously very important as well. Anyone else got anything else to say? So there's also a kind of depiction of almost like crucifixion type of pose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A man who is sort of facing... Absolutely. Um, it, it, is, it is like a crucifixion image. The, the image is um, uh, crossed by this, this or it, it is in the shape of a cross. Any, any other comments, just really obvious, um, the, the bodies here, what, what are they doing, how, are they, how do they look? <laughs> I mean, skinny, they're, they're full of suffering. Okay, they're emaciated, they're, yeah, they're, they're falling down, they're not, um, they're, they, they may be dead, they may be suffering, um, there is no hope or light or positivity in this, uh, in this version. Um, so there's a, there's a chaotic sense to this one as well, isn't there? Despite the cross form, despite the fact that there is a, is a, is a form to it, there's a sense of chaos with all of the kind of jagged lines. Um, in, in this one, there's a sense of harmony. So you won't be surprised to know that Rivera has been an artist that has um, generally been seen as romanticizing and being very positive about the revolution, where, where Orozco has been seen as being much more critical uh, and much more critical of the mythologizing of the revolution that, that we see in, in works like um, uh, Rivera. So throughout the sort of early post-revolutionary period but um, into, and into the sort of 1940s and 1950s, artists became increasingly critical of uh, the revolution. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is a fragment of a short story um, from 1953 by a writer called Juan Rulfo. So by the 1950s, it was clear <coughs> that the revolution had not changed much for the majority um, of the poor and indigenous people, had not changed much for the majority of people in Mexico, and that the white elites were still in power, and that the promises of the revolution, um, despite, all of the, um, despite all of the talk, uh, had not really um, been fulfilled. So this story, um, this is the um, opening extract from the story. So this is how the story starts. Um, it's the first hundred words, I've put it there. And it's narrated from the perspective of the peasant, of the campesino. So this is the group that was meant to have uh, ben benefited from the revolution and from land reform. Okay, So there were some land reform policies implemented in the post-revolutionary period, but this story comments on um, the efficacy and the val value of those land reform policies. So what does the title mean, first of all? Anyone? Yeah. We have 
been given. We have been given. So nos han dado. They have given to us. Yeah, we have been given the land. Okay. So if you, I don't know if you just want to um, read through briefly um, the the story for yourselves. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, and then I will put up a slide with some helpful vocabulary. There's a mistake, actually. That should be e de here. It should be e de and not de de. Okay, so I'll move on to the next slide, which has some um, vocab. Um, what are your impressions of this short story, just from the first hundred words? What is the tone of this story? So desperation. Desperation, yeah. Any other words come to mind? What do you notice about the language, yeah? Barren, why, why do you say that? Um, there's no, like, seeds or any, like, plantation. Yeah, so it focuses on lack, doesn't it? It focuses on, um, on the lack of all of these things that it mentions. No trees, no seeds, nothing, no roots, nothing. Very um, negative language, isn't it? We've got ni, ni. Uh, nada, repetitions of that N sound and what it, what it um, uh, connotes, which is the, the, the lack, the negativity. Yeah? Any other comments? Nothing else? Okay, so it's, it's, it's narrated, as I said, from a peasant perspective. As we've said, it focuses on barrenness, on aridity, on the lack of water, lack of shade, um, and on a long, tiring walk. Yeah, that's what they're engaged in, this long, tiring walk después de tantas horas de caminar. Okay. And this long and tiring walk is punctuated by what? Barking dogs. Barking dogs, yeah. Can we be a little? What, what might they? What might these moments symbolise? Anything? What are? What, what might barking dogs t symbolise? Bit of civilisation. Life, people, civilisation. Perhaps hope. Yeah, we're going to find something. We're going to get to something. We're going to. Um, we're going to arrive at something. And then disappointment. Pero el pueblo está todavía muy allá. Yeah? Es el viento que lo acerca. It's the wind that's making it look like it's nearer. Yeah? So a long walk, tiring walk across plains, punctuated with hope, then disappointment. So how do you interpret, now, now that we've read and analysed a little bit this, this beginning of this story, how do you interpret the title? Nos han dado la tierra. They gave us the land, but what is that land like? So we've been, we've been given the land, the government have given us the land, because that's, as I said, part of this land reform policy, but what's the land like? Is it worth having? No. So it's arid land. It's land where there's ni una sombra, the arable, ni una raíz de nada. There's nothing. So nothing grows there. So it's valueless land. So it's the title is. How might you describe that title if you were talking? Oops. Sorry. <laughs> if you were, if you were going to um, characterise that title. Um, 
Yeah. Yes, it's ironic. Okay, nos han dado la tierra. Sounds great, but um, this is the land that, that we, we've been given. It's rubbish. Okay, so it's, it's kind of like a curse. Nothing grows on it. So the long walk, and this, this uh, as I said, this is just the first hundred words and the rest of the short story, several a couple of thousand words or whatever, it continues with this image of a long walk. And the long walk is like a kind of representation of Mexican history from the perspective of the peasants, filled with the promise of revolution and land reform, but ending in disillusionment and no improvement in the conditions for most people, in, in most people's lives. Okay, so that um, is a little taster of university teaching of the kinds of things that you might be able to do and um, that you would be able to do in um, in the department of spanish portuguese and latin american studies obviously all of us are different we all do different stuff and teach it in different ways um, so this is just a little taster of, of what i cover um, are there any questions bearing in mind that you have a q and a se session on spanish with the head of department later so um, he might be better at, at, at uh, answering some things but you can try me and I can always sort of refer you to him um, later on. Yes? Will this be done in Spanish? Would you do this? I don't, te I, um, don't teach this course in Spanish. Uh, one of my colleagues, when she teaches this course, does teach it in Spanish. Um, so we all sort of do our own thing.